Today, I want to talk about this new company called GSX Tactile, Chinese name Gen Shui Xue, English translation, who do we learn from? It is currently being listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, its ticker number is GSX. The company is registered in the Cayman Islands. Its auditor is Deloitte. The company is operating under a uh, structure called VIE, or Variable Interest Entity. It is classified as an emerging growth company. When I first looked at this company, it does remind me of a, another company that recently was in the news, which is Lock & Coffee. Some of the similarities here. First, this company also IPO'd in 2019, just 23 days apart from Lock & Coffee's IPO. It also did a secondary offering just a few months after its initial public offering. This one actually sold more stock in their secondary, and 100% of the proceeds for their secondary offering actually went to existing equity uh, holders. So a lot of the early investors cashed out through the secondary offering. The next similarity is their supernova growth, very similar to Lock & Coffee. When you compare this company to some of the comparable online education uh, platforms in China that's currently listed in the US, their growth trajectory just seems too good to be true. It is also being classified as a Chinese technology company utilizing technology to disrupt a existing uh, industry. And uh, when I look at the underwriters and the ownership for the two companies, uh, there are some overlaps. For example, Credit Suisse is the investment bank that underwrites both deals for their IPOs. And also Morgan Stanley was the uh, was one of the investment banks for Lock & Coffee, and it is a major shareholder for GSX. Currently owns about 10 million shares of this company, which represents roughly 10% ownership. The Republic of China does not allow foreign subsidiaries to directly own a Chinese company. These are the actual operating companies in China that contribute to the revenue of the company. Baijia Yulian Technology is the actual operating entity of the company. This dotted line is basically a contractual relationship between a foreign subsidiary. The GSX TechDo is the Cayman registered company that currently has its shares offered in the United States. So basically when you buy a share of their ADS, basically you own a percentage of this shell company. This company itself does not have any direct operations. It does not do anything but other than having a subsidiary that has a contractual relationship with the operating company that actually generates the revenue. Larry Chan is the chairman of the company. He and the CEO currently own 100% of the operating entity in China. The equity investors do not directly own any percentage of the variable interest entities that's currently generating profits in China. Its auditor is Deloitte. Its annual fee for 2019 was $1.5 million. And the four investment banks that's involved in the IPO are uh, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, Barclays, and CLSA. The lead investment banks are Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse and Barclays and CLSA, they are syndicates. So CLSA is actually a subsidiary of CITIC, which is one of the biggest financial conglomerate in China, Zhongxin Tuan. So these are the companies that are responsible for kind of vetting the concept and then also come up with a valuation for its IPO. The company currently has 85 million Class A shares and 73 Class B shares. So for a total of 159 million shares, there is currently 238 million ADRs outstanding. They did their initial public offering back in June of 2019 for 19.8 million shares at 1050. Overall, net proceeds to the company was $196 million. Their follow-on offering took place a few months later at $14 a share, and then they actually, on their secondary, they sold 23 million shares, which is more than their IPO, and the proceeds was 327. And every single dollar of the proceeds went to existing shareholders cashing out, so previous investors cashing out, and none of it actually went to the company. Because the company claims that a lot of the short sellers, including Mighty Waters, didn't really understand how they were able to generate traffic and generate the kind of revenue that they reported. So I want to spend a little bit of time explaining their marketing strategy. It is very similar to guerrilla warfare. I'm using a first grade class as an example. They would use the most popular chatting software in China, which is WeChat. 
WeChat is very rich in functionalities. It can act as WhatsApp, where you can connect with your friends, your family. Uh, you can form different groups.、Uh, I think the largest group that you can form is 500 people. You can create a public profile page, which is very similar to a Facebook company page, and people can subscribe to that page, and then you can push out. Any company updates or marketing materials or any free informational material the subscribers would find valuable. The way it works is that first the company would create a public page, and then depending on whoever subscribes to that public page, they would add those subscribers to become their own friends. Once the friendship establishes. They would then do a number of different things. One, they can pull that person into a group chat that's already created to send more specific content to influence those people into a free class. By adding that particular person, they can also discover additional people who are physically located around that user. And all these different channels would simultaneously work together to generate traffic into their free class or their infomercial. And once a potential parent receives information, that person is encouraged to share the free class coupons with their friends. So anyone that falls into a particular category, for example, a first grader's parents, most of your social contacts and your friends typically fall into the same age group. All those different channels lead to someone participating in the the free class offer. And the teacher in this class is more like a professional salesperson. Constantly using marketing techniques that will ultimately lead you to purchase a class. And as soon as you register for the class, the app will ask you to add a tutor, give you a more personalized experience. And this tutor is actually a more you know personalized salesperson. And their target is to through all these channels funnel the people into here, and hopefully they can convert eight percent of the people who attend this class into actual paid、uh, customers. I am going to share a more detailed experience of the free class that I participated in. So this is the interface for one of the free experience classes, and、uh, what really surprises me is the lecture on the top right. He never changed his T-shirt、uh, over three days. I typed in a message just to make sure that these so-called lectures are not pre-recorded. So I asked the question whether if the classes are suitable for students from different cities, and he actually addressed my questions live. So it is proven that it's not a pre-recording, which makes it worth a little bit more than something that's pre-recorded. You know, as I kept on going, I saw some comments from supposedly other users saying, you know, it was very helpful.、Uh, I enjoyed a lot. You know, stuff like I'm not sure if those are real users, but、uh, I do feel like I was surrounded by different, you know, salespeople. It was very hard for me to distinguish what is real and what is not. And as as soon as I started like asking more questions, I received a video from supposedly the tutor.、Uh, I hung up, but she started texting me in、uh, our group chat, basically just telling me, "Hey, if you are interested in the class, you know these are the different breakdowns of the fees, and this is what you can save by applying today." This tutor never responded to my question before the class started when I asked. Uh, I am in a different time zone. If the class says it starts at seven thirty, does it mean that it's seven thirty my time, or does it mean seven thirty、uh, time in Beijing? But she never responded to me before. And as you can see in the following screenshot, I did not respond to any of her inquiries. But she just continued to bombard me with pricing information and uh, with um, you know voice messages and also text messages, just telling me that I need to sign up. So. Overall, it is definitely a very aggressive approach.、Uh, I think, given the sheer number of people they can actually bring into this free class, their approach definitely has a certain percentage of conversion. Uh, so, uh, again, you know, although I did not enjoy the marketing experience, it could be something that works for the group of people that they try to target. I want to use this YouTube analogy to kind of further explain how their strategy works and. To be honest, I think this company is nothing more than just a, a more glorified YouTube paid channel. All of its paid classes, you can just imagine them as a live broadcast of a, a particular topic or a particular you know study subject, and everybody that's participating in this broadcast are paying a very hefty fee 
for being an exclusive member who can actually watch this particular webcast. Let's say if you sign up for a first grade English class. So what that means is you have access to a member only playlist that only contains material for the English class that you paid for. And other members who subscribe to this main channel, depending on the subject that you purchased, you only have specific access to different playlists. And the way they recruit to the main YouTube channel is through smaller YouTube channels that have contents that target more specifically to a particular group. For example, let's say if I want to attract an age group between 30 to 35 year olds, I want to capture both Democrats and Republicans. And we know that Democrats like to watch the Game of Thrones and Republicans, they like to watch The Walking Dead. So what I would do is I would have multiple sub channels. One of the channels will only play shows similar to The Walking Dead so that I'll make sure everyone that joins in here will have a very good experience. While my other channel only plays shows that are similar to The Game of Thrones. But the objective of both channels ultimately is to direct traffic into my main YouTube channel. And what I have effectively done is I have captured Republicans and the Democrats within the same age group by showing contents that they each respectively enjoy. And for each of these subchannels, it would have a lot of different subscribers to justify its legitimacy. The company in, the, in its early stage would use a lot of different bots to actually subscribe to these channels. And then all the different conversations that take place within its channel are also generated by different robots. Within a channel that has over 100,000 subscribers, you would have the content creator directly message you. So I am much more likely to, uh, to subscribe to an, another channel and actually pay for it when a very successful YouTube channel content creator directly messages me. And so now just imagine, instead of just having one subchannel, there are over a hundred of different subchannels very similar to it. But every single subchannel is designed to bring traffic into the main paid members only channel. So I think this is kind of the gist of how their marketing works. So when I looked at the company's financials, I looked into this Benish M score. It uses eight different financial ratios, and then it assigns a different weight to every single metric to generate a number. The final number represents the likelihood of any financial manipulation happening uh, with the company's financials. So if you have a Manish M score that's greater than negative 2.22, then the company is likely to be a financial manipulator. So after doing my calculation, GSX's Manish M score is a positive 0 0.275. I used the numbers in its uh, 2018 and 2019 SEC filings to come up with this number. The number by itself is only an indicator. It, it is not. You cannot use the number alone to accuse a company of financial manipulation, but it is a very good indicator. At the bottom of this video, I have links to all the short selling reports. And if you want to spend some time, you can go through every single one of them. Based on my research and reading all the different short sellers reports, I think a few things can be said that definitely took place. They definitely used fake users. Bots activities is definitely present. Financial manipulation is very likely because I think the short sellers report did prove there were off balance sheet companies that, that acted as hiring agencies and marketing channels for GSX without having its financials consolidated with its SEC filings. A lot of those companies had registered addresses at the same physical location and had position postings served to benefit GSX without any of its expenses being registered on GSX's income statement. Its recent purchase of this real estate development for $75 million is also highly suspicious because they overpaid almost four times to the cost of its development. I did read a lot of different reviews because they adapt very aggressive growth strategies a lot of the teachers or institutions they claim uh, that are part of the platform sometimes are just a one person shop. And a lot of times the teachers that they actually hire do not even have registered teacher qualifications yet, which they claim every single teacher on their platform does have certificate. 
uh, the fake reviews are verified. And I think that is also a very common practice for a lot of different online platforms and online companies. And some of the other warning signs I do agree are quite legitimate. For example, the departure of a lot of the high level uh, employees at the time of right after the IPO is definitely a warning sign of instability within the founding team. And also some of their early investors cashed out uh, just a few months after their IPO is also another warning sign. The short sale report published by uh, Money Waters, he explained bot activities that took place when they joined classes. The three different bot activities they stated in their report, precise joiners is two people joining the class at the exact same second over different class sessions. So the same two people joining at the exact same moment more than once. IP joiners is users that share the same IP address, which is usually unlikely. The students should be geographically diverse and it's very unlikely for more than one student joining the same class using the same IP address since they don't operate any physical locations. And the third bot behavior is burst joiners, which is when you have a lot of people joining a class during a very short period of time. So the analogy they used is 10 trains passing through in, in a given amount of time. You have nine trains that are empty, but one that's very crowded. Uh, the company did provide a formal rebuttal for this short sale report. For all the large format classes they provide, they actually have a two teacher format. There's the main lecture for the class, and then there are uh, individual tutors supporting the lecture. So each tutor is responsible for a smaller subgroup of the students to make sure that that person can correct their homework. The company claims a lot of those tutor sessions take place prior to the, the main class. So the bot behaviors examined by Muddy Waters are actually those smaller tutor groups uh, joining the larger class uh, at the same time. If the tutor does not switch over to the main class, the software will automatically switch over. I did not personally test out to see if that's the case, but I do believe if the company makes it a official rebuttal, which is also available on the company's website. So I do believe there is some legitimacy to their claim. They cannot outright just lie about it and put it on their website. The first short sale report published by Citron Research based on tracking over 20% of the classes, they derived the revenue to be about 30% of the revenue that's uh, reported by GSX. However, the classes that Citron Research followed, it does not include the Gaotu classes, which accounts for about 70% of the revenue. So I think in a way, Citron Research's first short sale report somehow proves that the revenue number reported by GSX is actually legitimate. By just examining this company's business model, I do feel like there is a number of challenges facing this company. First of all, the only reason they were able to acquire customers at a very low cost is because they utilized the WeChat strategy. They were the first mover into the WeChat strategy and they were able to acquire a, a large uh, number of potential paid customers uh, at a relatively low cost. However, this is not a very difficult strategy. And as we already seen in the first quarter of 2020, their reported financials, now their customer acquisition cost has been going up. Large format classes is what they, they claim is their differentiation. However, I believe this class format does not really justify the cost of the courses. And these kind of formats will lack interactions and dilutes the actual user experience. Their marketing advantage and their large class format are not difficult barriers to entry. Anybody can switch over to large classes or start using WeChat to market uh, relatively easily. I don't think these are sustainable advantages for this company. And also about 50% of the revenue generated by this company is by its top 10 star lectures. That poses a great deal of key man risk. The star lectures can be you know, hired away by another platform or they decide to open up their own company. When I looked at their Q1 financials, their investment income was actually twice the amount of their uh, income from operations, which does raise concerns about uh, whether if they going forward, they're going to be relying on the money they generated through their IPO versus their actual business. And so what do I think will likely happen to the stock price? The company will put up a fight. Given some of the large institutions being shareholders, they will not allow this stock to lose 80 or 90% of its value overnight. They need to somehow find supports at various points 
to allow them to slowly exit their position. And also the Chinese government will have a very strong interest to not allow this stock to drop because having one lock in coffee can be explained using an anomaly saying that it's not a common occurrence. However, having another big fraud being exposed just days after locking coffee will seriously damage and tarnish the legitimacy of all Chinese companies and also the Chinese governing body. And those interests are not necessarily just with this particular company because by exposing a second Chinese fraud in a very short period of time, all other Chinese investments are at risk to lose their value overnight. Right now, it's in the interest of a lot of existing shareholders, large financial institutions, asset management firms, and also retail investors who currently own other Chinese companies, their current investments could be at risk. Overnight, all of those value could be wiped away. They will prolong this, the drop of value so that they have enough time to implement enough protection via maybe put options, uh, slowly reducing exposure to other Chinese companies to protect the financial interest of current equity holders. So my overall take for this company is even if we see a drop in the stock's price, it's not going to be something that happens overnight. It will be a very slow and precipitous drop over time. So if you like my analysis, please leave a like and subscribe, and uh, I will be providing content on additional companies in the coming days. Thank you for watching.